If you turn in your Bible to Acts 27, we find there a declaration from Paul, you cannot be saved. In the 31st verse, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. And there couldn't be a more conditional statement. Being saved, being rescued, being delivered, that's what's under consideration. And he said, it's unless they stay here, you cannot be saved. But can't God do anything? Well, he can. He can do anything, but what does he do? What did he say he would do? What did he tell them they had to do? There are conditions to salvation. Well, we could save everybody without regard to what they have done or have not done. It could happen. It's possible for him to do this, but it's not what he did. It's not what he said that he was going to do. There are conditions. There are terms. Salvation from God is always conditional. And this is no exception. So how do we get to this point here in Acts 27, verse 31, where Paul is crying out, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Well, it started earlier in the chapter, about verse 9. But basically, Paul is being conveyed to Rome. He has appealed to Caesar. And so they're sailing. The centurion has soldiers with him, a cohort, as it's known. He has his hundred soldiers with him, but there are also sailors, you know, the standard seafaring staff. <laughs> and Paul and the prisoners are on the boat. They're on their way up to Rome. However, in Acts 27, the record says this, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous, this is verses 9 through 12, because the fast was already over, meaning it's winter. Paul advised them, men, I perceive this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our own lives. Nevertheless, in the 11th verse, The centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. <laughs> but Paul says, this isn't going to go well. We should stop sailing. And the centurion says, duly noted. <laughs> Thank you, prisoner. <laughs> right? The pilot here and the owner of the ship, you know, they're the people the centurion listens to. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there. If by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, and winter there. Well, that's interesting. But yep. Yeah, Paul told them, this is not going to go well. And well, it didn't. A tempestuous headwind arose. The ship couldn't make it, verse 15 records. The ship was caught, couldn't head into the wind. We let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. So they just barely made it, is what he's saying. The storm arose and started to drive them. They should, you know, they would have missed this if they had harbored earlier. But on their way to try to get to the one that made sense to them, the storm arises, and with difficulty, they've secured the skiff, the ship's boat. What is it? It's the lifeboat. What is this? It's man's way, you see. It's man's way to be saved. We need that lifeboat. In case we have to get off of this boat 
In the case this boat is going to be wrecked or shipped, we need the lifeboat. That's what people will get into to get off of this boat. That is man's way. And as logical as that might seem, you have an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ on your boat. That makes things a little bit different. But in the 20th verse, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Yes, they're at sea and the storm is terrible and there's no light, no sun, no stars. And a terrible storm, many days, all hope of being saved is abandoned. You know, they're thinking that the storm has carried them, you know, out to the ocean or something. You know, they're just, they're lost. They don't know where they are, and they're not going to know where they are. They're not going to be able to find, or worse. But it's saying all hope was lost. They really believed. Well, that's the end. You know, this is how it ends. We're out here on this, in this terrible storm. And you know, that's the way it is in the world without God, without hope. But in the 21st verse, after long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. But now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe that God, uh, I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. Yes, he said to them, Ah, though all hope is lost because of the storm and because of the darkness, yet it's time to take heart because the message from God is you won't lose life. God has granted all those who sail with you, Paul. That's the word from the Lord God. Now, the first word was that this ship, or this, uh, yeah, well, this, this voyage would end in disaster. The, the ship will be lost. And when that came to be, that should have given a little more um, weight to Paul's words. Now he says, God has granted all those who sail with you. However, in the 26th verse, it said, we must run aground on a certain island. So there's a lot more to it, if you will. Oh, thankfully, God has granted them their lives. So now they will be preserved. But we must run aground on some island. Now, people are minded to think that this is incidental. That, you know, well, they've thrown over the tackle and all of that. So, yeah, they're going to have to have a hard landing. No, no. No, this is a condition. But you see, when people are not thinking right about God's salvation and they're not thinking right about what it takes to be right with him, you know, we're, we're looking at this account and saying, well, you know, we only spent one verse on running aground. You know, look at all the, the verses about how good God is, and how merciful God is. Well, okay, yes, it's true that God is good, and it's true that God is merciful, but that doesn't undo the condition that the ship has to run aground. But people do that all the time, you know. Well, the tiny island of our differences is nothing compared to the vast con uh, continent of our commonalities, you know, things of this nature. Sometimes you'll hear 
from Christians, no less. Now, the problem is, I don't believe your inferences are necessary. <laughs> You've heard that one, perhaps. <laughs> yes, I don't believe your inferences are necessary. Well, um, only if you want to be right with God. Only if you want to do what is found in the book. Nothing more and nothing less. Then, of course, it's necessary. Or sometimes people will point at that and say, well, look at all the things that Paul said. And there's this one thing about running aground. You know, this is just your little proof text to try and show that God has conditions on his salvation. You know, people do this. When you talk about baptism for forgiveness of sins, let's say. But no, there's a reason he said it. And yes, in the 30th verse, the sailors sought to escape the ship. What was happening here is they're getting close to land and they've been taking soundings and they're finding that, oh yes, we're coming up on land. We're going to wreck. We have no way of slowing this down. So they went over and made like they were letting go the anchor, but they weren't. In the 30th verse, they were seeking to escape and let down the skiff, the lifeboat, into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow. Which is, you know, the classic Sinatra song, right? I did it my way. <laughs> I'm going to be saved my way to be saved. Not God's way to be saved, right? They wanted to be saved their way. They wanted it to go the way that they thought it should go, the way that made sense to them, the way that seemed obvious. What is it? It's human wisdom, you know, following what people do, what people say, what people approve of. Maybe it's walking by sight, you would say the opposite of walking by faith. But whatever you might call it, what it is is not what God said to do. That's what it is. That's not what God said, which is what Paul says. When they let down that skiff intending to escape, Paul, the sailors let down the skiff, but Paul told the centurion and his hundred soldiers, unless these sailors stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Yes, when God set the condition that the ship must run aground, it was not incidental. The fact that he said it one time did not make it less important. The fact that he places conditions upon his salvation does not mean he's less powerful or incapable. When he makes that condition, he means it. You cannot do it another way and be saved. It has to be his way. That's what's happening here. They've already been granted a reprieve because the original prophecy was the loss of the ship and also your lives. But now God has seen fit to grant your lives. And they want to save the ship too. Well, not exactly. They want to be saved their way. They don't trust God to save them. They don't believe that what God said was the way that was going to work. But that running aground was not incidental. It wasn't just describing what was going to happen, what was going to take place. No, it was a condition of salvation for them. But the sailors, as we said, well, they're your standard seafaring staff. The centurion is in charge, and the soldiers are the, the point of the spear, you know. <laughs> so Paul speaks to the authority. The person who is in charge on this boat is the centurion. And he says to him, unless the sailors stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. 
which is to say he gives the centurion the tools that he needs to make the decision that must be made. The soldiers report to him. They do what he says. Which is how you end up in Acts 27 at verse 32. The moment of truth is this. And the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Yes, they cut the ropes of the skiff. They let it fall off. What does it mean? It means the centurion said, God is our lifeboat. Right? In his heart or aloud or not in so many words, what it comes down to is that the centurion believed God is the way that we will be saved and we're going to do it his way. We're going to do what he said to do. Here they are on this ship. Finally, they're approaching land. They've been looking for a respite from this tempest. They're hungry. They're panicked. Right? Coming up on the shore, the sailors know that the shore is approaching and the ship is going to have a problem. So they put the skiff out and the soldiers cut the skiff off. <laughs> we grabbed that thing back when we were leaving after not listening to Paul. Remember? Remember? trying to make a way to make sure that we had a, an escape hatch after the storm picked up. But now we understand, see? The condition. The condition shows the understanding. <coughs> Why do you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Well, in part because he said to do so, but why is it that you are not saved until and unless you actually Take the plunge. Well, it's exactly like Acts 27.32. You don't believe God until God becomes your lifeboat. When you cut away the other methods of being saved and put yourself into God's hands as the way to be saved, that, that is when God saves you. Now they believe, see? Now they listen to Paul's words, not because Paul has to be right, but because they're the words of God, and they know that now. They see now this is from God. Now the centurion uses the authority granted him and bends it to God's will. Now the soldiers use the, the swords that they have to cut the ropes, right? To do God's will rather than to cut the throats. <laughs> That's when they believe. That's when they're delivered, you see, in the eyes of God. So yes, salvation is conditional. There, the fact that God has put conditions on it is by no means a show of weakness on his part. He could do anything. No, what it is is a show of strength on his part. He commands something from us. He tests us and finds those who are worthy by means of the conditions of salvation. But let me ask you, who is this centurion anyway? <laughs> he started out, eh, duly noted, Paul, thank you for your input. You know. <laughs> but then he's telling the soldiers, you cut that skiff off. Keep all the sailors on board, right? Who is this guy? Well, this was interesting, I thought, and... I wanted to share it with you. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but look at this. It's kind of interesting. In your 41st through the 44th verses, striking the place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. 
Not so stern anymore, I guess. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, because they're soldiers, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. See, this centurion wanted to save Paul. It was his desire to keep Paul alive. So when the soldiers had this great plan, I know how we keep everybody from escaping. Let's kill them. <laughs> well, that does make it simpler, to be fair. But the centurion wants Paul alive. So he tells the soldiers, no, that's not what we're going to do. And he tells the people who can swim to jump So it was that all were brought safely to land. It's what God said would happen, that they would be safe. But it happened by faith. See, when the centurion believed, he met the conditions. He bent his will to accomplish God's will, and this is how they were saved. The same centurion, chapter 28 is responsible when Paul arrives in Rome. When we come to Rome, 28, 16 says, When we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. The rest of the cargo of the prisoner ship were delivered over to the jail, but not Paul. Paul gets to stay by himself. Under guard, the centurion gave Paul liberty, you see, a certain measure of liberty. He's under guard, house arrest, if you will, but he's in a much better place than jail would be. In fact, what you find is that the Jews are coming to talk to Paul. The leaders of the Jews were summoned in the 17th verse, Paul Summoned the leaders of the Jews together. And at the 23rd verse, they appointed him a day. And many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified about the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets, morning till evening. The centurion allowed Paul to have an audience to appoint a day when the public could come and listen, and he taught from morning till evening. And he wasn't teaching the Roman pantheon. He was teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in Rome, the capital of the empire. <laughs> the centurion saved him alive. The centurion put him at liberty within limits. The centurion allowed him to entertain the public not entertain as, as in dance for them, but to, to let people come to where he was staying and listen. The centurion supported him, if you will, while he taught all day long. And it wasn't Rome's religion either. And in the 30th verse and the 31st verse, Paul there dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God, teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. He gave Paul that independence there in his own rented house. He gave Paul boldness. Paul received anybody who would come. He proclaimed with boldness and without hindrance Nobody forbidding him. You know, this little gig here for two years, this is better than the whole time in Jerusalem. This is better than Thessalonica, right? This is better. Well, I started to wonder, well, who is this fella? 
What is the centurion? What do we know about the centurion? Well, what we are finding out about him is that he gets it. He understands. Did he obey? I don't know if he came to obey or not, but we know that he gets it. I hope that he did. That'd be nice. But I hope that everybody obeys. <laughs> well, what I found is, of course, the, you know, you don't have to be too terribly sharp to read earlier in chapter 27 and see that he was given a specific name there. But the thing that is not clear to me there is what it means to say august. Until I did the study on the original, and I found that the word, the Greek word there, um, for august, um, you know, like our English word august, is, well, for one thing, it's a word for something that is, you know, stately, something that is revered, um, you know, pious, respectful, you know, something like this or something that ought to be respected or revered. But the other thing that I found is that it is the word, which I should have remembered, I don't know how I didn't, but uh, it is the word, it's the root that is used for everything pertaining to Caesar. All of the words for things that are in Caesar's court, in Caesar's temple, Caesar's high priest, uh, Caesar's birthday, all of those words have this word at their root. August. And it's what happens in Acts 25 when Paul, you know, this is how Paul got on the boat in the first place when he was testifying. Remember, uh, he appealed to Caesar, which is referred to in Acts 25 and verse 21. Um, by Festus, it said, Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus. I commanded him to be kept till I could send him on to Caesar. The decision of Augustus is actually the decision of the august, or the, rev the reverend. That's the way that they refer to Caesar. And so also in 25 of the same chapter, Acts 25, 25, I found he committed nothing deserving of death, and he himself had appealed to Augustus, so I decided to send him, which is a lie, Festus, but all right. Um, again, he appealed to Caesar, appealed to the emperor, is literally to the august. That is significant because the centurion's name is Julius, not so important, but the centurion is the Augustan cohort. Why? It makes perfect sense. Paul has appealed to Caesar. They put him on a boat with a centurion headed to Rome. What centurion is it? It's Caesar's centurion. <laughs> the cohort is the hundred who belong to him. This is Caesar's centurion. He's come to get the prisoners who have appealed to Caesar and take them to Rome to appear before Caesar. They're in his custody. Why is that significant? Because look what God can do. Do you think Caesar heard about this? <laughs> what happened to that nice boat I got you, Julius? Ah, come on, man. Well, my Lord, let me tell you. Right? You think Caesar heard about this? Hmm. I thought that was important. That is putting something on there in addition to the fact that, that God places conditions on salvation and that God can deliver us 
from death and from every storm of life. You see in the background here the provision of God, the, the providence of God for Paul, that he put him in the hands of somebody capable and influential, and that he gave him favor with this one so that he could preach the gospel. Paul could preach the gospel still. And this one who listens eventually, who comes to see it eventually, yes, that was a choice that God made for the preservation of Paul, for the preservation of the gospel, for the proclamation of it in Rome. And yes, Paul would appear before Caesar. Do you think the story of his journey to get to Caesar, you know, at the behest of Julius, might have come up? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2 Paul has a lot of places where he talks about ships and shipwreck and other things. But Hebrews 2 is a very good one for us to think about when it comes to salvation. Hebrews 2 and verse 1 has an idiom in Greek that is very useful to us. He said, we must give more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And yes, the drift there is the nautical term. If you are on a boat following shore, you cannot rely, <laughs> you know, pretty soon, very quickly, the shore disappears if you are not watching it. So pay very close attention or you'll drift away and you will lose sight of the shore. <coughs> But of course, the shore in Hebrews chapter 2 is the word of God. If the word spoken through angels proves steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord Jesus and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, his apostles, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, and also with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Stay close to the word, he said. Pay close attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. Said a man who survived shipwreck. Yes. He understood that we've got to follow the conditions of God. We've got to trust in him that he will save us in his way, as he has said that he will do it, even if it's not my way and it's not uh, maybe even what seems to make sense. That's not really the point. It may not make sense to you at first. You come to understand things later. And Romans is written to Christians in Rome, and yet he talks to them about, don't you know, as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. You know, we learn things as we continue to grow in the faith. We have to pay close attention to what we've heard so we don't drift away from it. God bore testimony to his son Jesus and to his chosen apostles by means of the miracles they were allowed, but it's the word that they're testifying to all of them. And that is the word that saves us in all of the mercy and goodness that it contains, but also in the conditions that it contains. Paul said you cannot be saved unless they stay inside the boat. And he believed that and cut the skiff. Today in Mark 16, in verse 16, we can read, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved, and whoever does not believe shall be condemned. If you believe... Jesus, then you will be baptized the same way that the centurion cut the skiff. And God will save you. 
We have water prepared that you might do that very thing. If you are not yet a Christian, it's time to become one. If as a Christian you have not lived right, repent and make things right with him. Let's lean on God and on his power and on his word. He is right. The Bible is right. It's the way. It's the only way. And we've got a hue close to it. We don't need to drift. If you as a Christian have drifted away, repent, return to where you've fallen. And let us pray with you and for you that you might be restored to him. If today you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, either way, please let that need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.